This is Dr. Russell Blaylock, and you're listening to the Blaylock Health Channel. For this session, I wanted to discuss briefly some of the new developments in cancer research, things that should concern you and help you make an informed decision should you be faced with this terrible disease. Now, unknown to many, there is a revolution going on in the world of cancer research. And of course, the fact that this information remains unknown to most people is always true. That is, that most research is hidden far away from most people outside the scientific world. Not purposely hidden, but uh, rather because most people are not concerned uh, with newer scientific breakthroughs or they don't read these highly technical journals. It probably surprised many of you to learn that a large percentage of practicing physicians also are not aware of these discoveries and the changes in scientific thinking concerning cancer. In fact, scientific research rarely comes to the attention of practicing physicians until it has been buried in the scientific literature at least for 10 years. Now, most physicians, including many oncologists, still hold to the idea that any cell in the body can become a cancer if enough mutations occur in its DNA, and that the best plan of treatment for these cancers should they develop is chemotherapy and radiation in combination or following surgery. Now, the big secret among oncologists, which is rarely told to patients, is that once a cancer metastasizes, that is, when it spreads from beyond the site where it originally occurred, the chances of a cure is only about 5 to 10 percent using all of these conventional treatments. Another deceptive bit of language used by oncologists is to tell patients that a combination of drugs or some new chemotherapeutic drug is highly effective against their particular tumor. That is, that the tumor shrinks uh, dramatically with treatment. Now, what the patient is not told, beyond the fact that 90 to 95 percent of the time the tumor will not be cured if it's metastasized, is that chemotherapy is not killing the cells that are actually responsible for the cancer itself. And further, that the cells that are responsible uh, for the cancer are resistant to these drugs and to radiation treatments. In fact, these special cancer cells can become dormant and hide for as long as one or even two decades, only to spring forth later uh, and cause cancer to once again return, this time with a vengeance. And when it returns, it is completely immune to all conventional treatments, completely resistant. I would think that these bits of information would be of real interest to the cancer patient and to the oncologist treating that patient. Now, to withhold this information would be a violation of what we call informed consent. In other words, your right to know everything about your treatment. Now, before I discuss these special types of cancer cells, first I want to discuss the newest ideas on why cancer occurs at all. Now, actually, this is not a new theory, but one that was first proposed in the 19th century by the, what we consider the father of modern pathology, Dr. Verkow. It was recognized at the time that people who had chronic inflammations of various types often developed cancers at these various sites, even with scars and gunshot wounds. In fact, the theory that inflammation caused cancer was quite popular among physicians at that time. But like most of these early theories, it fell into disrepute over time, and new ideas eventually took its place. In fact, inflammation as a cause of cancer was completely forgotten until recently. Now that we know a great deal more about inflammation itself, the link to cancer seems much more logical, and a great deal of research backs up this idea. And I'll have to leave out a lot of uh, discussion on the exact mechanism as it involves uh, a tremendous amount of cell biology and knowledge of the immune system and cell signaling. So it gets pretty technical and, and difficult. Suffice it to say that the central cell mechanisms of inflammation also trigger cell proliferation and virtually all aspects of cancer growth, such as angiogenesis, cancer cell reproduction, invasion of surrounding tissues, and metastasis of the cancer to other sites in the body. Now, when you have an injury, let's say you get a small cut, Quickly after that, you notice that the margins of the cut turn red and it gets swollen and it's tender. Now, this is because white blood cells rush to the site of the injury and pour out a number of immune chemicals that are associated with inflammation. So there's an area of inflammation around that cut. Now, several of these immune chemicals, which we call cytokines, 
stimulate the cells around the cut to start reproducing themselves quite rapidly, and they invade the area of the cut. This is the healing process. Once the healing is done, the inflammation is shut down, and these cells stop dividing. Now, what researchers noticed was that in all cases of cancer, even in the earliest stages, they saw this very same process was occurring. So they linked the rapid proliferation of the cancer cells to the very same immune chemicals. That is, uh, cytokines like interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. These inflammatory cytokines act as growth factors for cells. In other words, they stimulate cells to grow very rapidly. Now, based on these observations, they looked at a large number of people who had in some sort of inflammatory disease. And they found that having an inflammatory disease for at least 10 to 15 years greatly increased these people's risk of developing a cancer of some type. They also knew that people with certain inflammatory conditions had a much higher incidence for certain cancers. For example, chronic infections, schistosoma infections, that's a parasitic infection in the bladder, produced in a lot of the, these patients bladder cancer. Helobacter pylori, which causes ulcers, also produces gastric cancer and gastric lymphoma. Cytomegalovirus, associated with glioblastoma multiforme, a very malignant brain tumor. Epstein-Barr virus, Hodgkin's sarcoma, HHV6, leukemias, HPV, cervical cancer, hepatitis C and B associated with liver cancers, SV40 associated with sarcomas and mesotheliomas. We know that autoimmune diseases such as ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, uh, were associated with colon cancer, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus associated with leukemia and lymphomas, pesticides and herbicides. They're associated with leukemias and lymphomas. Organochlorides that you see in drinking water, the chloridated drinking water, renal cell ca uh, carcinoma. Chronic skin irritation, exposure to UV light, sunlight, uh, squamous cell cancer and melanomas. Iron excess, liver cancer, lymphomas, lung cancer, and breast tumors. Fibrocystic disease of the breast, breast cancer. And heavy metal toxicity like mercury and lead associated with glioblastomas, and in the case of mercury fillings in the teeth, oral cancers. Now, what all these conditions have in common is they all cause inflammation. And in many cases, if you block the inflammation, they do not produce the cancers. Often we see this with cancers, for instance, associated with infections and autoimmune diseases, HPV, for instance. If you give anti-inflammatories to people that have HPV infection, they generally don't develop the cancer. So you're probably thinking about now, well, why doesn't inflammation cause cancer in everybody? After all, you don't develop a, a cancer every time you cut yourself or if you catch a virus and get uh, inflammation. Well, the key seems to be chronic inflammation and usually one that goes on for years or even decades. Now, under such conditions, the inflammation causes an outpouring of massive amounts of free radicals. And these free radicals damage the DNA of the cell and this leads to mutations of a great number of the DNA uh, molecules, these chromosomes. Now, the DNA mutations, especially when they're numerous, a lot of them, we call them hundreds of mutations, uh, have always been considered to be the cause of normal cells becoming cancerous. Now, the idea was that mutations damage the DNA controlling checks and balances that keep normal cells from becoming immortal, because an immortal cell is a cancer cell. The problem was that if you take these cells and implant them in an animal, most of the time it will not produce a cancer in the animal, even if you suppress the animal's immune system. Now, this brings us to the second part of the discussion. It wasn't until 1905 when Dr. John Beard proposed his so-called trophoblastic theory of cancer that the ideas about cancer begin to change. Now, he proposed uh, that the very primitive embryonic cells, that is, cells that had not been committed to produce any particular tissue organ, they weren't fully mature, uh, that these cells were scattered all over the body, lying dormant, and that when these cells were irritated, they would spring into action and generate a cancer. Now, at the time, this was a very popular theory. It seemed to make sense. But like most theories, others pushed it aside, and until recently, uh, it was forgotten. So now it's been resurrected. Now, newer research concerning stem cells has virtually exploded with the hope that 
uh, or damaged uh, and diseased organs and tissues can be replaced by injecting stem cells in the body, stimulating them to produce new tissues and organs. So that's the normal healthy stem cell. Now, we knew that stem cells are scattered throughout the body, just sort of like this trophoblastic uh, idea. Now, based on this idea, cancer researchers hit on a further idea that perhaps there were similar mutated stem cells that would form cancer, and they dubbed these cancer stem cells. In other words, they're not normal stem cells. They're damaged. Now, when examined, these cancer stem cells in many ways resembled normal stem cells, but critical parts of their DNA had been damaged and mutated. In essence, there were some differences between a normal stem cell. Now, interestingly, cancer stem cells only make up a very small portion of the bulk of a typical tumor. Some cancers have no more than 1 or 2% of their cells are composed of these cancer stem cells. And others, such as a highly malignant melanoma, can have almost half of the cells as cancer stem cells. But it's the stem cell that's producing the tumor. I compared it to a, a child's bubble blower where you dip the little ring in soap and you blow it, and all these hundreds of bubbles blow out. Well, the stem cell is the ring, the bubble blower, and the bubbles that are blown out from it represent the daughter cells, the bulk of the tumor. Now, it's been shown that cancer stem cells are highly resistant to traditional treatments, such as radiation and chemotherapy. What the chemotherapy agents and radiations are killing are the cells produced by the cancer stem cell so-called daughter cells. And this is why the tumor shrinks. But unless the cancer stem cells themselves are killed, the tumor will just grow back, and it often grows back a much more aggressive and deadly cancer. The cancer stem cells are directing the entire show. So recent studies have shown, for instance, that they suppress the immune system's ability to kill the tumor. That is, it hides the tumor cells from the immune system, sort of like a cloaking device so that the immune system never sees the cancer. It also causes important anti-cancer immune cells, such as macrophages, which is one of your major cancer-killing cells, to switch itself from a cancer-killing cell to a cell that protects cancers. Because the cancer grows very rapidly, they can outgrow their blood supply. And if they do, then the cancer will quickly die. So what the cancer does, it secretes or causes other cells to secrete special chemicals that produce a lot of blood vessels, tumor blood vessels. And we call this process angiogenesis. These blood vessels are essential to the cancer's survival. Now, cancer stem cells direct this process as well. Now, if that isn't enough, the cancer stem cell causes the release of special enzymes that allow the cancer cells to break free and spread into the neighboring tissues. In other words, they become invasive, and even to spread widely throughout the body, what we call metastasis. Now, you recall I told you in the beginning that once a cancer spreads, that is, once it metastasizes, the chance of survival is no better than 5 to 10% using all conventional treatments. Now, pharmaceutical companies are working tirelessly to develop special drugs to either kill cancer stem cells or to force them to return back to normal stem cells, which can occur. Now, interestingly, a number of natural compounds, such as curcumin, quercetin, resveratrol, and the sulforanes, can kill cancer stem cells. They also can dramatically improve the effectiveness of chemotherapy against the cancer cells and reduce their toxicity on healthy tissues and organs. So when you hear doctors tell you, well, don't take that curcumin or that quercetin because that might interfere with the chemotherapy, they don't know their own scientific literature because the scientific literature clearly says it dramatically improves the effectiveness of chemotherapy and makes it safer. Curcumin, EGCG, which is found in green and white tea, apigenin, silabenin, aged garlic extract, and resveratrol also block major cancer stimulant chemicals like the uh, insulin growth factor, one, and can have powerful effects in preventing cancer uh, development, that is, from it ever developing at all, and can cause the death of cancer cells once they do develop, especially when they're used in combination. In other words, if you use curcumin and quercetin and EGCG and resveratrol and silymarin together, it's even more powerful. Now, several natural compounds significantly reduce cancer invasion and metastasis. 
such as blackberry extract, curcumin, quercetin, resveratrol, apigenin, luteolin, EGCG, and grape seed extracts have all been shown in carefully conducted experiments to inhibit the invasion and metastasis of human cancers. Because many chemotherapeutic agents are inflammatory, that is, the drug they're treating you with actually produces inflammation, they have the potential of making the cancer become more aggressive and more deadly. So when you combine them with these natural compounds, that reduces the inflammatory effect of the chemotherapy and the radiation and lessens that risk of making the cancer more aggressive. So I hope you found that this information is useful and you now better understand why conventional treatments often fail to save cancer patients and that there are ways to attack these cancer stem cells so that you have a better chance of ridding yourself of the cancer itself. If you enjoyed listening to this week's podcast and would like to hear previous episodes of the Blaylock Health Channel, go to our website at www.blaylockhealthchannel.com. Thank you. The information contained within these programs is not intended to replace or contradict that of your physician. This information is for educational purposes only. 